my name is John Zaratsky. I'm a user experience designer at uh, YouTube, where I work on tools for video creators and curators. Before that, I was working on advertising tools at Google. And prior to that, I was working for a startup in Chicago called FeedBurner, which is where I met my friend Matt Schaub. with FeedBurner, and I was our director of user experience. All aspects of user experience were involved in from designing on the front end to um, writing a lot of the copy for the site, a lot of communication, a lot of explaining to do in various parts of FeedBurner, and also uh, providing uh, direct customer support. So the end-to-end -end user experience was a big part of mine and John's lives at that time. And I think the uh, principles, tips, techniques, bits and pieces we've got to talk, with, uh, talk about with you today Although we really derived those uh, during this kind of startup-y experience with FeedBurner, uh, we feel that they apply to whatever size organization you might be from, from four guys in a van all the way up to a uh, major corporation. So I think they should work fairly well for that purpose. And are we bit lead? There we go. Uh, the back channel, uh, as I think all these talks have, there it is. So hop in, and we'll look forward to the questions later. Take it away. All right. So as we said, this is a talk about user experience. It's not exactly a talk about design, at least not in the traditional sense. So what's the difference? When most people think about user experience, they think about usability, user interface design, interaction design, and these are very important things. I mean, this is what we do uh, you know, most of the time in our day jobs. Um, and it also makes up the core of the experience that people have using your product. But it doesn't end there. There are so many other things that affect the user experience that don't, don't fall into that category of design. And that's what we want to talk about today. So we've got seven principles and a handful of concrete tips scattered throughout that will help you create experiences that will delight and serve and engage your users. And there are things that you can do even if nobody in your organization has designer in their job title. We think that these are tips that anyone can use. So the first one is simple, but it's very, very important, which is why we start out with it. It's to be fast. And one of the reasons we like to talk about this first is that it kind of uh, you know, emphasizes the point we're trying to make here, which is that you've got these technical factors that impact the user experience. They don't, they don't fall under the umbrella of design, but they really, really matter to the people who are using your software. So our first tip is to focus on latency. Basic stuff. Pages should load quickly. Users should get immediate feedback when they do something. Your app should feel snappy, generally. And it's not just about user experience. This stuff can have a big impact on your business. So we've got a case study here from Mozilla, who recently optimized their download page for Fire Firefox. The only change that they made is they shaved about two seconds off the page load time. They didn't change the way it looked. They didn't change the way it worked. This is the only thing they did. And what was the result? They saw download conversions improve by 15%, over 15%, right? So this is an example of the impact of latency not only on user experience, but on business. And you can check out, they've got a, a blog post about this if you follow that bit.ly link there. Of course, speed is very important to Google. Part of why people like Google is that it's fast. Search results load quickly, and you get to where you're going very quickly. In this slide, I've used Firebug to measure how long it took to download and render this page. 470 milliseconds, that's pretty quick. There are a lot of cool things about Firebug, but one of the, the really great things for purposes of measuring latency is the net tab there that maybe you haven't seen. That allows you to see exactly how long it took every single component of the page, the markup, the CSS, the JavaScript, the images, to load. And that's really interesting when you're trying to speed up your web app. Beyond that, you know, detailed advice on improving latency is a bit beyond the scope of this talk. And we, promise to talk about user experience, you can learn a lot about you know, making your, your application fast throughout the rest of the conference. But I do want to mention a few other resources that are really valuable. PageTest at webpagetest.org allows you to analyze not only a single web page or a single site and see what's slowing it down, but do comparisons between multiple sites. So you can actually watch how pages are downloaded and rendered in, in real time or in slow motion. And you can create a video of that, too. And I have a video I'll show you in a second. Page speed and, and y -slow are very similar. Um, they're both add-ons to Firebug that will analyze your page and not only show you, you know, how long things are taking to download, but they'll compare your site against a set of best practices. In the case of y -slow, developed at Yahoo. In the case of PageSpeed, developed at Google. And they'll give you advice on how to improve. 
So as promised, I've got a video. This is generated um, at webpagetest.org. And what I've done is, is I've put in the search results page for Google, for Bing, and for Yahoo. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch in slow motion as each of these three pages download and render. So we're seeing time at the bottom, and this is running slowly. And you'll see that all three search engines, they load the content in on the search result page pretty quickly. When they're finished loading, as in the case of, of Google and Yahoo, the page turns gray. Bing is actually just loading a background image. And then it finally, it finally finishes. But you know, the content was there from about one second. So you know, not trying to make any, any point about the choices that these teams made, but you can see how this would be useful for your own site. Looking that and seeing in detail, OK, you know, it's OK if this big background image doesn't load in. It's OK if something that's, that's aesthetic, mostly, in nature doesn't load, as long as the important content is there. And even investors, well, some of them are savvy about this stuff. Fred Wilson is a venture capital investor who's been involved with a lot of successful companies and a lot of unsuccessful ones, too. And he says that speed is the most important feature. Okay? He's not an engineer. He's not a designer. Um, he's an investor. And, and, and he thinks that this is true. He brings up a great point here, which is that speed actually matters more to casual mainstream users because they don't know how hard it is for your application to be fast. Right? They just want it to work. The people in this room, you know, in power users and developers, as Fred puts it, we're a bit more sympathetic to how, how difficult it is to make a web app fast. And so we tend to tolerate a little bit more when we see a slow app. So moving on to our second tip about speed. It's not enough for your application to be fast. You need to do things to make your users fast, too. There are a lot of little shortcuts that you can provide. And I'll sh run through a bunch of tips and examples um, to help you make your users faster at using your application. If you don't pay attention to those things, not only are you going to slow people down, but all those little things, day after day, time after time, are going to add up and make the experience just a little bit more frustrating for your users. So as a very simple example to start out, let's say we've got a page that's got a, a form on it with four fields, right? And you know that when people get to that page, let's say it's like the you know, compose screen for sending an email or writing a message, right? You know that they're going to want to start typing in that first field right away. So a simple thing you can do, very easy to implement, is automatically focus that first field. It's going to shave half a second off. People aren't going to have to use the mouse to locate and click on that field. Mm -hmm. It's not going to change the world, but it's going to make your users' lives just a little bit better. Here's an example from an airline website where they're remembering recent input. So especially with airlines, this is actually a really smart thing because you generally fly between just a handful of airports, right? You're not flying all over the world from and to many different airports. So it's useful to remember the inputs here. So rather than having, again, to you know, locate that field and type into it, you can just you know, pick one of the selections that's already there and be on your way. And Matt pointed out a, another sort of bonus example from this, uh, from this case, is that, which is that the developers took the care to actually use the HTML label element around round trip and one way so that you don't have to find that tiny little radio button and click on that. You can click anywhere on that label and trigger the selection you want. Again, not going to change the world, but it's a nice little thing that's going to speed up your users and make their lives a little better. Yeah, big targets are always better than small targets when it comes to uh, using the mouse, for sure. Totally. And exacerbated by mobile devices. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So here's another small thing that's easy to implement. It's not, gonna, not necessarily going to be important for all of your users, but certainly for some of them. It's tab order, right? You're going to have a series of fields in a form that people are going to go through in a predictable way, most likely. So the tab order should mirror that. In this case, you know, physically on the page, at least in left to right language, the fields are username and then password, and then the sign in button, and then the remember me checkbox. And this is from Twitter. Presumably they put them in, in this particular arrangement because they thought it looked good, right, for aesthetic reasons. But if you're using this, you're not going to click the sign in button before you check the remember me checkbox, right? So if you are typing using the keyboard and tabbing, you actually want to go in a slightly different order. So the developers at Twitter took the time to say, you know what, you're going to type in your username and then your password. And then if you want the remember me option, you actually have to check that before you hit the blue button. right? So they got the tab order right so that it, it mirrors the way that people are actually using it. A few other quick ideas that we don't have examples of. Matt mentioned earlier 
generally, you know, big click targets on mobile and on desktop, really, really useful thing. You've got a form. Make sure that people can submit the form by pressing enter, right? They don't have to, to use the mouse and find a button. Um, if you have sh keyboard shortcuts in your application, if there's some you know, consistent standard for how those, app, how those shortcuts yeah. should work, you know, use those. Don't make people relearn things. And just for fun, let's talk about a few offline examples. Um, this thing on the left is an oil filter, but it's got this really annoying plastic packaging on it, right, that you're going to have to like, get out the biggest scissors in your house or some kind of knife. You're going to have to wrestle with it and open it up. It's really, really frustrating, right? Just the packaging. I mean, I'm sure it's cheap and easy for them to make, but it's really hard for you as the customer to open. While I was browsing around Flickr, I also learned that you can open these things with a can opener. I didn't notice that. I didn't know that, but it's a tip for you guys to use when you get home. Life hack. <laughs> it, Amazon knows that that packaging can be a source of frustration, so they invented frustration-free packaging. So, you know, you buy this toy, and instead of having to deal with this plastic wrapping that's all around every single piece of the pirate ship, you get a nice cardboard box, right? You can open it up, you take your toy out, you know, you or your kid is, is happy. And finally, some things are supposed to be slow, like food and drink, right? You're at a restaurant, you don't want to be rushed along. I haven't thought of any web app examples that are supposed to be <laughs> slow, but, you know, maybe you guys will. Perhaps a web chess or something to that effect. <laughs> um, principle two, be yourself, sounds simple, I realize. Um, what I think this is, is all of us giving ourselves permission to let a little bit of the spirit of the team that creates the thing appear in the thing itself. And that can take many different forms. It depends on the kind of an application you're writing, whether it's mobile, whether it's for the desktop, whether it needs to communicate certain traits. Security and trustworthiness, pretty useful for a financial website or a banking application. Uh, playfulness and engagement for something that's more social or game oriented. And empathy for an application that may be used frequently in a high, um, high turnover, high stress work environment. That's where the tips like set the friggin' focus on the first form in the field um, really come in to save people minutes and untold aggravation every day. And um, I think essentially this comes down to uh, giving yourself permission to do this. And it's also, I think, uh, a big part of this is if you have an application that has a fair amount of text and a fair amount of either real time or asynchronous communication, um, in this case there's a lot of explaining going on or there's a fair amount of uh, text to uh, describe features, that's an opportunity for the personality of the team, the personality of the company, and really it's almost like a branding issue. How do you want your product to feel and be perceived? That can come through in the text. And I think all too frequently, um, teams large and small don't give themselves permission to say it how they really feel and think, well, we've got to be corporate with this. No, <laughs> you don't necessarily have to be corporate with this because the people doing the job may not be thinking about the product that way. But enough about that. Let's take a look at a few examples. Uh, Brizzly is a service um, I'm sure some of you use. Allows you to see Twitter and Facebook and multiple accounts from each in, in one web application. It's a great sort of a social aggregator, I guess I'd call it. And they've got a, a 404 page, like many other 404 pages in all the land. It lets you know that what you tried to visit isn't there for whatever reason. What they do that I think is smart here is I think they realize they have a generally um, tech savvy or early adopter oriented audience at this point. They don't need to over explain what happened. Uh, they've got their branding element with the Brizzly Bear there, which is kind of fun. It's like, okay, well, there's not a page here, but hey, he's smiling at me. And example number three, this web server is bonkers right now. I think that's, a, that's an explanation that pretty much you don't need to say much more than that, that that might be exactly what's going on. This is, at FeedBurner, we, uh, we had a 404 page that said trouble at the mill, and that infuriated a number of people just because it didn't provide a proper explanation for what might be going on. We did provide more detail further down the page, but there are cases where too much detail and, not, and, and, and no way to act on it is not going to be a good thing. And in this particular case, it's like, okay, I'm going to try this again later or try some other website. And Brizzly can pull it off because yeah. it, it's, it, fundamentally it's not a super serious application. Right? That's true. But uh, yeah, not if Brizzly you're bank. trying to pull your bank account together, then maybe that's not so hot. So a few other examples that we found here and there. Uh, in Gmail, uh, I think a while ago, maybe now, I'm not even sure, uh, you could select uh, to have somebody show in your chat list, depending on how often that you email them, and just finishing with the, the status message, it's magic. That's great. Just don't over-explain these things. If it's kind of a cool feature and you don't need to go into much detail, and it's kind of cool to just say, hey, it's this thing we did, that kind of language, I think, is, is totally appropriate. Again, the tone of your application needs to 
it needs to reflect what it needs to reflect. Now, AdSense, somewhat more serious application. People are using it to make money, to manage what they publish, and earn, earn in, many, in some cases, um, their living online. And this, in this particular example, it's an alerts box that had important accounts level, account level messages and error messages that you needed to act on. If there weren't any found, you can just say, no alerts found, you can go play outside. Maybe come up with two or three different messages you might show there if, uh, if everything's done um, and there are no alerts in here. There's, even though this is a serious application, this is exactly the sort of playfulness that I think you can, you can tweak into it without, uh, without doing yourselves harm, and in fact, creating a little better engagement, a little better emotional connection with your users. And then finally, the last one, uh, somebody must have punched the history eraser button. So are you sure you want to forget history? If you do, you'll be doomed to repeat it. You can get away with, it. You can get away with a, a joke or a pun here and there if it's, uh, if it's uh, an application that's not doing something too serious. But in this particular case, um, I don't know where we found this one, but uh, it doesn't really matter. I don't, I don't know what was going to get deleted there, but it's another one of those examples of um, stuff, that you can, stuff that you can make happen that should have a fun effect. All right. So one way to, to improve the user experience of your product is to actually engage in conversations with your users or potential users. When you do this, people like you more. They're more willing to forgive you. And they see you as kind of being on their side, right? Sort of takes away that wall between you know, developer and user, right? And you're all sort of in this together. Now, of course, companies haven't always engaged directly in conversation with their customers. But starting in the early 2000s, a lot of companies started to have blogs so that they could respond to other blog posts, that they could host comments on their own site. And obviously, as you're all aware, since then, there's just been an explosion of ways for people to talk about us as developers and for us to talk back to them when it's appropriate. So the first important tip here is simply to listen to what people are saying about your product, and perhaps more generally. Um, this is all about monitoring those various conversations that are happening about your company or your product, whether it be on blogs, Twitter, Facebook, um, the list goes on and on. You know, just to run through some simple tools here, many things I'm sure you've heard of. Google Blog Search gives you near real-time results about what people are saying. Technorati. <coughs> Same basic idea has been around for years, and for good reason. It's a really useful way to track what people are saying about your, your product or your company. And Twitter, of course. Twitter lets you, you do a search, save that search so it's easy to get back to. I particularly enjoy tracking these sorts of things on Twitter because I think it gives you access to a different type of information than you would see on a blog. It allows you to see things that are too new for people to uh, you know, have made much of a stink about it, or too small. You know, they figure, oh, this is a minor annoyance. Um, you know, it's not worth writing an email to the developer, but I'm just going to post about it on Twitter. And if that's something that you can, you can see and say, hey, actually, I've got an idea for how to fix that, you know, that can have a, a really great impact on the user experience of your product. So provided you've been using these tools, you've been listening, you, you, you know what people are, are doing, um, you know, sometimes it's appropriate to respond. And when you do, it's very important to respond with honesty and humility. And Matt's got a great anecdote to back this one up. So this was uh, early 2006 with FeedBurner. FeedBurner was growing as a service. Um, we were identifying publishers large and small to, to work with. And we were also adding uh, new staff and bringing them on board with how we do things. And again, I mentioned some of the things that we do earlier. Um, was a lot of folks in the company were involved in um, providing direct product support. Everyone was generally pretty engaged with what's going on with the business, and, if not helping um, our users directly in some form or another. And uh, one of the new employees that came on, uh, one of uh, his jobs, or one, one, one of his, his responsibilities was to uh, build some of that publisher engagement and get some of the bigger publishers to start using some new services we had for publishers and eventually uh, get them involved in our ad network. And, at the same time, FeedBurner had a very straightforward, very str um, um, simple privacy policy, which was at registration time, we said, um, give us your email address. We won't spam you, honest, ever. And that was just it. We would, we would never mean to contact a publisher unless they contacted us first, for example, for, for support uh, with an issue with their account or their feeds. And so uh, this employee put together an email, sent it to, I think it was 90 of our top publishers. It was a very well-written email. It explained that we have some new features and some new capabilities that are coming together, and we'd like to get them involved in it. And I don't know, five, 10 minutes after that email went out, late on, a, on, a, on an evening of some kind, uh, there were uh, blog posts straight away saying, hey, I just got some spam from FeedBurner, WTF. And I think that stands for where's the fire. 
And the, uh, immediately, those of us who are out there uh, with the keyword searches with Technorati and um, um, if we had uh, powers to see the future, we would have uh, seen the tweets. Um, saw those posts, got out there, made some comments, but our CEO, Dick Costello, figured out, well, this is not, we need to post about this right away. We need to say something because um, this, we aren't going to be able to respond here, 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 and here. And so he, he, he put a blog post out there that was an extension of a comment that he put on one of the posts. And I'll just point out, we're very quick to promote our own success around here when we sign deals and work with great customers. So we have to look ourselves in the eye and challenge ourselves when we screw up. So we basically said, this is not how we do business. It's a mistake. It's a cultural issue. We need to help people understand how we do things. We're not going to do it again. We're sorry. And this happens to be one particular scenario where this happened. I think what you do when you have a general openness and transparency about responding like this, you buy yourself a second chance when you screw up. And you're going to screw up at some point. And this, I think, just gives you a better chance of an out. And in this particular case, uh, the bloggers in question, again, 90 of our higher profile publishers, said, OK, yeah, we know that's not how you guys do this. We've seen what your personality is in your site from the way you've communicated before and the way you've generally run things. Uh, it does feel like it was a one-time thing. And thanks for clearing that up. Also, I think Dick's in a session at uh, 3 o'clock today. And hopefully, he'll be signing blackberries or something like that. We'll see. <laughs> Um, surprise, surprise. So I'm currently a user experience designer with Google working still on our publisher tools. And I guess the example here is the one that I'm, the mobile, the mobile one. Yeah, OK. For some reason, I was thinking I was going to go to the other example. No, this is good. So there was a set of our publisher tools that we created a, a, a mobile uh, version for. Somebody had an idea. There was kind of a hackathon. We took one week aside from our regular um, responsibilities and said, let's build a mobile version of this part of this application. And it would be perfect for the situation where you need to stop these things from happening or go investigate them or put a star on them later so you can go look at them when you get to the office in front of a, a proper desktop. And this is one of these um, higher stress, um, more repetitive type jobs. So it's one of these cases where the more control you feel you have over the situation, the better. And so we designed and built this thing in about a week. We're starting to test it with a few people. And then three days later, got it, somebody saw a tweet. So here we are in the present day. Uh, got a tweet saying, I sure wish Google would launch a mobile version of that thing. And so somebody from the team, like two hours later, said, hey, you want to come to the New York office on Wednesday and test it? And the guy was like, uh, sure, sure, I'll come in. And so he came in. He gave us some great feedback, changed a few things about the design. Uh, we were going to test it at some point eventually, but we saw this, we saw this uh, tweet out in the wild and basically got some good feedback. He, he walked away happy. We were happy to have an opportunity to have something lucky like that happen. And by surprise your users, I guess I'm not saying wait for serendipitous opportunity. Like we had a hackathon and somebody tweeted that they wanted the exact same feature to happen. But the more attention you pay to the conversations that are going on out there, the likely, likelier you are to make your own luck and end up in a situation like that. And I forget what comes next. Yes, well, there's always, as far as surprise and delight is concerned, uh, swag is, is a powerful motivator. It's uh, kind of a branding issue, too. If you have a logo or you have elements of your application that you can distribute as stickers, stickers are great to get out there. Um, if you have spontaneous meetups or uh, community uh, developer events that you're involved with and your product can have a few things along with it to um, move your brand and move your message and move your sort of look and feel out into the world, it's a great way to do it. And delighted users are a good thing to have. And this is one of the, one of the easiest ways to do it. I know almost all of us will do anything for a t-shirt. I know I still will. So <laughs> it seems to, be, seems to be eternally effective. So sort of continuing on this general theme of providing your own support, it's a great way to, sometimes you don't have a choice because you're, uh, again, it's that two guys in a van scenario. You, there's no one's going to provide support except you. It's a great way to stay connected to what's going on with your product, what ideas people might have for it, what's going wrong right now. The pain that's something you built and deployed to production is causing somebody else is a pretty solid direct line motivator for you to go fix that thing and, uh, and, 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 and make the fix happen. And so that's, that, that's a good thing to do. And as far as... Uh, platforms for doing that. There are a variety of ways of doing that. There is, of course, paying attention to those conversations in Twitter and Technorati and so forth. But for having a conversation, um, you could install your own forum or bulletin board software. PHP BB is what we used back way back when with FeedBurner. We use groups now with the Google version. There are lots of platforms for this. Get Satisfaction, we point out, is one that uh, has, it, it, it has uh, support 
forums that end users as well as employees uh, visit and manage and interact in and work for multiple products. So I believe one login at Get Satisfaction will work for you for multiple products that you might use. So that's convenient. And in general, if you have a platform like this or something well-defined, these people that keep coming back again and again, the, these early testers that you meet that you end up with direct email conversations with, and folks that seem like they really get it, they're really interested in the space you're working in or the mobile application you've got or whatever your technology is, they'll go out and help other people and ask you for help in giving help to those other people, and they sort of become super friends or super users that you can then use the T-shirts and the swag and the so forth to reward for their service, and if you give them a platform for this, it's a way to kind of handle the scaling issue of customer support um, once it grows well beyond, once let's say things go well and things grow well beyond your ability for the two, four, eight, 12, or even um, however many of you there are to handle it that can't be focused on support because I realize that's not realistic for every organization. So platform is good. And I'm going to continue the streak here. <laughs> Principle four, <laughs> be willing to yet. give up control. So what this really is is not invented here is, is kind of a thing that I don't think is a problem for many of the people in the room because we all use third party, well, almost all of us probably use some third party libraries. We freely share code. Uh, we use various other third party services to make things happen. I mean, that's fairly common with, 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 with us. But this also applies to things like, I'm not very good at accounting or invoicing. I'd like somebody to handle that. You might hire somebody, of course, to do that in your office, but if that's not an option, there may be some application you find that can help make that work for you. Um, for our specific example, um, at FeedBurner, we had a, a fairly strong uh, sense of brand and design and color palette that, 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 uh, that we established early on. That was the relatively easy part. The harder part was if we needed illustrations for particular seasonal events or um, launches or certain blog posts and creative material. None of us had illustrator or, uh, uh, photo, 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 or photographer talent level talent. None of us had anything beyond uh, uh, the ability to put together uh, decent interaction design and make the web graphics. But uh, a resource like iStock Photo is a great place to go for you to find those elements. There are lots of illustration primitives, lots and lots of photographs, lots of bits and pieces that can help support whatever the goal is that you want to accomplish. This is the case where if you decided to try to do all that in-house, you'd be spending probably an awful lot of time coming up with not-so-great stuff when something excellent is out there. There's one risk that we've talked about with this before, which is, well, what if somebody else uses the same infographic to communicate their big product launch? That's pretty low risk, and you're going to find a set, a set of artists um, or creators that really match up with what you think your, your uh, personality is, and you're going to kind of go to them again and again, and you're going to, you're going to kind of own that, that look and feel after, after some period of time. And I just don't think that's a big enough risk to, to really worry about. All right, and now politeness. So the, the fifth principle that we want to talk about is to be polite. And this is kind of an odd one, um, so let me give a little background. First of all, I need to give credit to Erica Hall, who's a designer and founder at Mule Design, a design agency in San Francisco, because she gives a really great presentation called Copy as Interface. And the point of this presentation is that the majority of the interfaces that we use day to day, you know, in high profile, popular applications, are mostly text, right? So, you know, most of what we're, we're seeing and interacting with as users is actually text. So we really need to pay attention to the text that's in those interfaces. She has a variety of different you know, pieces of advice for doing this well, but the one that I really like is to be polite. And to a certain extent, this is common courtesy, right? Um, you know, you want to design things that are, that are uh, considerate of your, of your users, that are friendly, right? You want to put yourself in the mind of your users and walk through your application or walk through a given experience and say, where would this be annoying? Where, where would this piss me off, right? And think of it in that way. So here's an error message I saw the other day. Um, not really, but I mean, there aren't, there are many error messages out there in the wild that really aren't a whole lot better than this one, you know? They tell you something is wrong, but they don't really give you a way to find out more information or figure out how to fix it. And apart from the message itself, this okay cancel combination is rarely useful, um, especially in an error message. It can leave you sort of feeling like, um, you don't, you don't have any control, right? There's nothing you can really do. It doesn't matter which button you're going to press. So, of course, you don't need me to tell you not to write unhelpful error messages, so let's talk about some hopefully more interesting examples. So the first tip here about being polite is to make it easy for people to get started. 
You know, again, this is sort of common courtesy. If, you know, if we were going to start having a conversation, we wouldn't kick it off by asking each other for date of birth and mother's maiden name and maybe a credit card number, right? If, we, if we'd start talking, if we need to collect more information, like a phone number, we would certainly do that. So why, do you, why would you do something like that with your web application? Not that any of you do, of course, but I've seen it out there. Um, this is a really great example of, of a, a smart way to do this. TripIt is a website that allows you to, to save and share your travel itineraries. And one way you can get started using that site is to actually forward your email confirmation that you get from a site like uh, Expedia or directly from an airline. Just forward that to plans at tripit.com. And what they'll do is they'll get your email and they'll parse out all the information about your flight or your hotel or whatever it is. And they'll send you back an email and they'll say, hey, we got your email. We've created you a shell account. We've put your information in it. If you'd like to use TripIt going forward, just click on this link and sign up. Okay? So that's a really, really nice, simple, and clever way of making it very easy to get started with an application. You know, things like OpenID can make it really easy to get started, provided that your users have an OpenID and know what it is. There, there are other options as well. There's, you know, Google and, and Facebook and Twitter all have these federated sign-in options. And the reason this is good is that you know, people don't have to create yet another account. When they get to your site, they can use something they already know. It's easy for them to remember, get started right away. You know, generally, people don't like creating new accounts for things. And they're not very good at remembering arbitrary strings of text, you know, passwords, right? So they tend to use the same password over and over. So not only is it a frustrating experience, it's also kind of a security problem. And on the flip side, it's not enough to just make it easy to get started. You need to make it easy for your users to leave or stop doing whatever they're doing in your application. Um, so make it easy for them to, to sort of um, cancel their account and leave. Give them a way out or a way to cancel whatever they're doing. People don't like to feel trapped, so if you can avoid building dead ends and dark alleys into your product, they're going to be much, much happier. Uh, Matt brought up an example recently that is kind of the, like, you know, the original example of this principle, which is, you remember those like, top of page links that you used to see on a lot of long web pages back, you know, back in the 90s when you know, people didn't want to have a link to a new page, so they'd use anchor links a lot, right? And you, you know, I guess this was before they invented scroll wheels or something, so it was not that easy to get back up to the top. But just, just when you're feeling kind of like, hmm, I'm sort of a long way down this page, right? Oh, there's a very convenient top of page link. So that's the basic idea. It certainly has evolved since then. Here's something that's actually really, really common on the web today, which is great, which is providing a very simple, clear way to cancel whatever action you're about to take. So whenever you have something like save changes, have cancel and don't save. Right? It's important to not only have cancel, but explain what that means. Right? If you cancel, what is not, what's not going to happen? Right? You're not going to save in this case. So let's talk a little bit about making it easy for people to leave a service. This is Brizzly, yet again. And you know, their sort of account cancellation experience is very straightforward. It's right there on their settings page. It's easy to find. And the thing I like about it is that they use really clear language. The button says, delete this Brizzly account forever. It's very clear about what's going to happen. You don't have to worry. It sounds immediate, right? It's a very polite way to handle account cancellation. Netflix has really taken this to a new level. They have a very sophisticated design for allowing people to leave the service. So cancel, uh, the ability to cancel your Netflix account is also on their settings page. It's also very easy to find. It's even more prominent than Brizzly. It's right at the top here. And not only do they have a clear cancel link right here, but they have the option to put your membership on hold. And this is really nice, because you know, sometimes you're moving, you're, you're on vacation, you just don't feel like having DVDs sent to your house for a while. And so why pay for that, right? Why not put your membership on hold? That's a very considerate, very polite thing for them to offer. But let's say you do click Cancel Membership. You go to this next screen, which, which sort of explains what this means, what's going to happen, right? You know, you've got to send your DVDs back. Don't worry, we're not going to charge you anymore. But the thing that I, that I really like here is that at the very bottom it says, you'll, you'll still have the option to restart your membership at any time. And this is really nice. You know, you don't have to, they're not sort of guilting you, right? They're not sort of saying, well, you can cancel your account, but uh, we're going to delete all your data and, you know, you're going to have to recreate it next time. You know, they make it really easy for you to come back, which is, again, a very, a very uh, 
considerate design on their part, I think. Prepare for failure. Well, it's not as simple as it sounds in this case, but we might have heard this one before, thinking about uh, fast failure or concept of, uh, well, we're gonna move quickly, we're gonna see if this is right, if it's not right, we'll do another iteration, um, we'll make a change to this, we'll make this gray instead of blue, and I, you know, eventually it'll work out. That's, that's fast failure, that makes a lot of sense. What we're talking about in this case really has a lot more to do with weird scenarios, I think blind alleys, dark, or dark alleys, blind exits, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, forks in the road, sticks in the mud, that sort of thing. Odd interactions as well as things that are totally out of your control that you can prepare for in order to essentially keep your service up and running or make sure things are still available and working as close to uh, correctly as possible. As well as weird little interaction situations such as the first example that you may not see unless you start doing some usability testing or start using the thing in the wild. So this is a, uh, a, a security dialogue from Mac OS and there are situations where if you're really quick with the keyboard, you can get this dialog to appear. This actually happens on login, general login more so than, the, than this particular dialog, but this is for effect. Um, you start typing your username, you tab to the password field, you start typing. The system says, oh, I'm gonna set the focus on the name field, but you were already ahead of it before it called that event and then set the focus back on the name field, so your password just starts to show up out there in clear text because it switched the focus back without asking you. Is that your password? Totally. So th there's a, a, a fair amount of my personal information in the next few slides, so um, please try to pay attention. Get your notebooks ready. Yeah, yep. Um, so 23 Skidoo Street. So this, basically, in this case, you could make sure that if somebody has the password field and is typing in it, don't take the focus from the password field. Something you wouldn't think about, because you're like, oh, we're gonna set the name field, nobody's ever gonna get ahead of it, but in practice, if the system works with the timing in such a way that this can happen, you need to make sure that you handle that sort of thing. So messy data entry. Why force me to enter the parens and the m dash or the da m dash or the dash or the HTTP prefix if you need to give me a website address or I need to give you a website address or in I think a number of cases I don't even need to indicate it's a visa. I can just start typing the credit card number. You're gonna figure it out. If you can do this sort of stuff for data entry, especially repetitive stuff, um, if somebody, people are in here doing this every day and it's not like a one-time account setup feature, even then you still wanna do it because I just wanna make it as quick as possible for you to fill out this form and not throw an error message, cause a failure to happen that we didn't need to validate for. Th make, make messy data entry as possible as it can be for the user and it'll make them happier. And again, it, this is kind of empathy sneaking in here is that you've tried to absolutely make sure that bare minimum uh, error cases are the ones that you're gonna report on and stop somebody from making progress. I like this um, particular example just because it shows uh, kind of readiness for anything. The BBC always has a high and low graphics version of I think all their major news sections. I'm not sure how deep this goes. Uh, the low graphics version will render on just about any device, which is nice to have generally speaking. You almost always know you can go to slash uh, low there and get to that content. Um, the high graphics version, of course, is whatever bells and whistles they, they, they care to deploy. Um, but let's say there's a bandwidth spike, there's a major news story, something big is coming. Let's say something, you're about to do a major product announcement and you know your homepage is gonna get slammed. You might just wanna have a plan B um, homepage that makes sure that the news still gets through. It seems obvious, but plenty of times people don't think about it. They don't prepare for this particular kind of failure, which in this case is something that could have been very good, goes horribly wrong because you weren't ready for it. And having that alternative case ready to go could save you a lot of heartache. And well, there's the, the fail whale from a year or two ago. This is actually an image from iStock photo. And uh, this became sort of famous for, well, something has happened with Twitter at this point and we're not gonna be able to um, get the tweets to you at the, uh, for a little while, but we'll be back as soon as we can. And it became something of a cultural phenomenon. It became certainly something that folks at Twitter uh, would, well, I guess if they could have tweeted about it, they would have tweeted fail whale as a trending topic. Um, <laughs> it was one of those things that simply uh, became a, 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 recognized, um, a recognized icon for when things weren't quite going wrong, or weren't quite going right. And it essentially gave them a, it's not really, over, certainly not over explaining what was going wrong, but it gave them at this point in time a fairly familiar way of saying, okay, here's the thing that's happening, you know what's happening, we're gonna get it back up and running as soon as possible. Um, meanwhile, uh, iconic image for you, which led them, of course, to eventually start working on what supports our seventh principle. Which is to be reliable. So 
in a sense, we've kind of brought this, this presentation full circle. I started out by talking about latency, which is a technical factor that has a big effect on the user experience. Reliability is the same way. Nothing's more aggravating than software that crashes or a website that goes down unexpectedly, especially when it's something that you really rely on. Of course, the stakes are higher for certain types of applications. You know, we've talked a lot about banking and, and you know, those sorts of things. If, if uh, your bank's website is, is unavailable or acting uh, sort of erratically, not only are you not going to trust that website, you might actually not trust the bank, right? So this sort of thing can have a, a really huge impact on, on that company's reputation. And as Matt mentioned, to sort of flip this Twitter example on, on its head, you know, the fail whale and their, their error page that was, was very nice to look at, it was very friendly, it was cute, definitely had a positive impact on the user experience, right? Making a, a bad situation slightly less bad. But the real improvement came from when they focused on reliability, right? They committed as a team to making the service much more reliable, to making it something that you can depend on, and it paid off big for them. Partially as a result, I think, of their reliability improvements, Twitter is now not seen as a toy. It's seen as, as an essential tool for a lot of people. It's seen as this incredible platform for communication. And now it's at the point where I can't remember the last time that I saw the fail whale, except for when I was making this presentation, of course. So that wraps it up. We talked about seven principles. We scattered some tips and some examples in there. The first one, to be fast. Not only should your application be fast, but you should allow your users to be fast at using it. You should be yourself. You should let the, the spirit and the personality of the developers come out in the product. That'll give you a point of view. It'll give you, your users something to relate to. Engage in conversations with your users. Figure out what they're experiencing, what they're going through, and talk with them. Be willing to give up control in those cases where it can actually result in a better experience, like where you, you know, get your artwork from somewhere else because you can't do it yourself. Be polite, be considerate, think about things from the perspective of your users, make it easy for them to get started, make it easy for them to leave or get out of whatever they're doing. Prepare for the likely event that your users will fail, will run into a problem while they're using your application and try to work around that. And finally, be reliable so that your users can actually use the product that you've created. Thank you, that's it. Hi, great talk, and there's just two things that I keep running into and wondering, how hard is it to tab to the state dropdown and let people use the keyboard to actually enter their state instead of having it automatically go to the zip code and then you have to use <laughs> the mouse to go back? Yeah. That's a great example of one yeah. of those tiny little things that like, very, very little effort would be required to make that work right. And as far as failing, um, I keep running into websites where you have to have Flash in order to even mm. see the site. There's yeah. no way past the, f the Flash page to get into the site. Yeah, that's another great Don't example. Don't they want us to look at the site? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm going to open up the wave here in case anybody put questions there. If you're uh, the save and cancel slide that you guys had up there? Yeah. You actually, on the uh, form development, you actually had a button and text. Right. Um, could you guys tell me about a little bit on the decision tree on why you guys, you know, prefer buttons in certain situations versus text? Is it via, like, success rate and trying to guide the user through a process? Or, you know, I don't know. I've seen a ton of things and reason why. I was just wondering what you guys have behind it. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that's a, very, that's a very specific sort of design issue. But generally, my thinking on that is that, um, you know, buttons are good for a, a, an action, something that's really going to do something. And in that case, the link is the opposite, right? The link is, yeah. is not doing anything. 
Um, it also just comes down to visual focus. You know, generally a button's going to be heavier visually than a, than a link, so people are going to see it and recognize that as the primary action. Um, and, and finally, just the simple matter of, of click target size, right? A big button is going to be easier to click than a small cancel link, and so you don't want people accidentally hitting that cancel link. If you had two buttons that were the same size right next to each other, it'd be pretty easy to um, either mess up and hit the wrong one, or you know, you'd have to sit there and sort of squint and say, okay, which one's the one I really want in this case? Yeah, uh, a Google-specific question. Do you guys actually use like uh, usability test labs and actually run your users through visual experience like eye tracking and things like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So at Google, we, we do the full gamut of user research from uh, very tactical, specific you know, usability testing and, and eye tracking all the way to uh, you know, ethnographic um, studies where we just go to somebody's office or go to somebody's home and talk to them about how they're using products. And paper prototypes and uh, show a series of mocks and have, have people just uh, get a look around a conference room in an afternoon. Very, yeah. very scrappy stuff, too. Yeah, I've noticed like, my users in my labs are actually kind of put off on the fact that they're in a lab, but whenever I go to someone's cube, I get it way better results from anything I ever developed. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, you know, we didn't really talk about research here, and, and uh, I kind of uh, wish we had a little bit, but, um, but yeah, it's important to sort of have a good cross-section. You don't want to be overly reliant on one research technique, or it's going to affect the results that you get. And mm -hmm. I'm guessing you guys are huge on remote usability testing. Uh, what do you guys actually use for, you know, getting users across the globe to test? I don't actually know. I know that we do it. I don't know the specific tools that we use for that, though. The, you? you mean the, the WebEx equivalent? Or yeah. The, the conference? The oh, what is that thing, thing called? Yeah, I can't even remember. Uh, where's Tomer when you need him? Uh, what is the name of that thing? Hmm. If I can dig that up in the next 15 minutes, I'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> I can't, it's, a, it's a Windows, I know it's a um, Windows-based client that we were typically using that and uh, would it have to on all, no the controls on our end were windows based but anybody could use it there was a java applet of course on the other end so any platform could use it to sign in okay we and used then the one called user view but it was limited to windows yeah i can't remember our mac based users are just you know screwed yeah i don't remember what the heck it's called okay. yeah it's cool that's right that's right and that's yeah, Skype is actually, I've, I've definitely heard that before, that it works, works really well for that. Yes, sir. Yeah, when you were talking about uh, making text friendly, how do you handle localizing text that's, you know, works as something that's more cultural? Well, that's a, that is a challenge. Um, the, I, I think the reality of having a personality has a, a lot of, it, of course, it has a lot of cultural connotations to it. Like, I was thinking of, there, we had a section on FeedBurner that was my feeds blank, and that we'd always put some phrase in there, and it was typically something out of uh, something vaguely seasonal or might have a slight baseball reference, or I stuck in a, a TK421, uh, TK why aren't you at your post at one point? And, you know, so that was for the five people that got that. And so that, that part of it is just kind of saying, we're not going to be predictable here. And I think if you have an organization that is building a product that's going to be localized, you may simply not get the same benefits and effect unless your localizers are in on it. They have whatever that, sen whatever that sense is can translate. If there's a humorous aspect to it, that's always tricky. I mean, I, I, don't, know that, I, don't, I don't know that I'd ever promised success there, but if there is, we want it to be whimsical and playful and empathetic, and we want it to feel like, if you could somehow communicate to the folks that are doing the translation, this part of the app needs to read like it's really on your side. However that can be nuanced, I'd take a chance at trying to do that, because that's ultimately what you're trying to communicate in any language. It's definitely harder, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I certainly don't have a pat solution for that. Yeah. Although I hear our Russian translator was hilarious. <laughs> Hello. Um, I wanted to ask if you have any experience or tips when you're designing for uh, children, like 10-year-olds. Uh, mm. I know they, they, they don't pay like, attention to instructions or something like that. So how would you compare that uh, when you're designing for kids uh, compared to when you're designing for adults? Well, nobody pays attention to instructions, so. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, kids might actually do a better job of reading the instructions than any of us do. But. That's not something I have any experience yeah. with, unfortunately. Okay. Um, any, any references or ideas you think is help, helpful for, for that? You're probably already aware of this, but I know there has been an explosion of um, 
applications targeted at children, especially for the iPhone and iPad, just because it's such a it's such an immediate interface. Um, so you know, I'm sure you're familiar with with many of those, but I would look there just to see some examples of what other people are doing. Okay, thanks. Yep. Hi. Hi. Um, some, some Google website uses uh, like unexpected results such as if you search something on Google Maps, for instance, from uh, get directions from New York to Paris, it says like, you know, uh, swim <laughs> like 10,000 miles, you know, or, or I think it used to be at Google search, when you uh, search for Chuck Norris, it says you, you, you don't find Chuck Norris, it, he finds you or something. Right, <laughs> right. So what do you think about that kind of user experience? I'm for it. Um, <laughs> uh, I, as long as it doesn't get in the way of something that's life-threatening or mission-critical or high, high frequency, nobody likes to hear the same joke. And you're not probably going to run that same query 59 times, although you might be interested to see if you get different instructions. Uh, this time, try it butterfly instead of backstroke, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think, in general, that th I, that's actually one thing from the be surprising uh, principle that we mentioned. I didn't, I, I forgot to touch on, which is Easter eggs. Little in jokes when the right things uh, combine can be fun, as long as they're sort of whimsical and off to the side and don't get in the way of whatever the critical thing is that you're doing. And in this case, you know, I think those those searches are not super critical. Although, um, I guess you could decide. Uh, I'm not sure how you actually opt out of those. Yeah, so I think in the case yeah. of um, the Maps one is a really, really good one because yeah. it, I mean, you're realistically not going to use Google Maps to figure out how to get from New York to Paris, right? That's not a, it's not a realistic uh, use of that tool. So that's a perfect opportunity to inject a little bit of humor. Um, yeah. The Chuck Norris thing, like, as long as the real search results are also on the page, you know, let's say you're actually doing yeah. research about Chuck Norris for some legitimate purpose, you know, you don't want to be blocked from finding the results. You know, then yeah. then that's just it's just fun. You know? we'll, yeah, we'll make sure the scholarly reports still get through. But uh, <laughs> the uh, the um, the awesomeness side is is fun to feature up top if you can. Okay, I think we've we've yep. worn you down. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thanks.